It's 2020 and there is a revolution underway. Hi, I'm Kathy Smith and welcome to On Health, The Art of Living. What is the average American eating? Why is gut health so important? What is this new research? If Americans get five or more servings of fruits and vegetables a day. Shocking. I was sucked in after the first chapter. The more that you focus on the path, the more likely the goal will come to you. The podcast is available wherever you listen. So just search The Art of Living with Kathy Smith. Hi, I'm Kathy Smith. Welcome to On Health, The Art of Living, where each week I bring you the latest information on how to live a healthier, more vibrant, more passion-driven life. So today's guest is Dr. Felice Gersh, and she's gonna be answering the most frequently asked questions I get about time-restricted eating. Last year's podcast with Felice was one of the most popular we've ever had. So as most of you know by now, time-restricted eating is a nutritional approach based on when you eat and Basically, all the meals and snacks are consumed within a particular window of time. Outside that window, no calories are allowed. Now, this approach to eating can boost your weight loss, but it has so many other benefits. Lengthen your lifespan, reduce insulin resistance, improve heart health, and have positive effects on your immunity. So you can check out Dr. Felice's first episode at kathysmith.com slash podcast. Just click on episode 85. Today, we're gonna delve a little deeper into all the questions you've been sending me about time-restricted eating. Some of the questions include, what's the best time of day to eat for weight loss? What are the potential downsides to fasting? Is there science behind it? Can I exercise while fasting? What do I eat when I'm not fasting? As a reminder, Felice is an award-winning physician. She's a board-certified gynecologist and obstetrician, and she's also trained in integrative medicine. She received her undergraduate degree from Princeton and her medical degree from USC School of Medicine. So on that note, let's welcome her to the show. Hi, Felice, welcome to the show. Great to be here, great to be back. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's amazing how popular your segment was, Felice. Honestly, one of the most popular, uh, and it keeps getting more and more uh, listens and views. But so I want to build on our last uh, discussion and our last, uh, the time we had together. So let's just, for people who didn't hear that episode, why don't you give us a, a, a top line overview of what is time restricted eating and then really go into the question that everybody seems to be asking, what is that ideal window? So let's start with that. And hopefully that's not too much information or too many questions all at once. Oh no, we can handle it. <laughs> so the, the bottom line is that we humans, like every creature on earth is evolved to live on planet earth even though we love space travel and we love the idea of science fiction we are totally earthlings and as earthlings we evolved with the 24-hour rotation of earth on its axis and what that means is that we are really two different creatures we are a day creature and we are a night creature and our metabolism which is all about the creation distribution and storage and utilization of energy is create, created in, and utilized very differently, whether it's in the day or in the night. And this, of course, involves food because food is our energy intake. So we evolved as humans to be vitally active and much better in terms of our digestive system, our use of glucose, our insulin sensitivity, all of that if we consume our food predominantly in the first half of the day. And it's not like, oh, I, I really prefer to eat at a different time. You can prefer whatever you like, but the reality is that genetically we're programmed to deal with food much better in the first half of the day. Unfortunately, our society, our civilization has evolved for us to eat the exact opposite way from the way we've evolved. So I try to emphasize, we try to do our best. So it turns out that our insulin sensitivity is so much better in the first half of the day. And there's a lot of data now that shows that if we consume a significant portion of our calories within a couple of hours of awakening, so we call it breakfast, but I like to think of it as a morning meal because it doesn't have to include conventional breakfast foods, which often are not the healthiest foods. And then we have maybe a later lunch 
that's sort of about half the size of breakfast. And then we have an early dinner, which is kind of light. And then we stop eating. The earlier, the better. You know, they, did, they have had studies where you can actually correct a lot of metabolic problems if you have a bigger window of fasting. So you stop eating at three or four o'clock in the afternoon. But I realize most people are not gonna do that. So I say at least forks down by 7 p.m. And then you want to get a minimum of 13 hours of fasting from dinner to breakfast, not from a late dinner to a late lunch. That's where people often make the biggest mistake. Now we are very adaptable, so we can adapt to many different styles of eating and times of eating, but if you wanna optimize your metabolic functioning based on our genetic programming, then you want to try to consume more of your calories in the first half of the day. And then when we talk about time-restricted eating, we want to realize that we were not evolved to be eating continuously. Now, I know a lot of people have advocated you should eat every two hours, every three hours. That actually is not an optimal way to eat at all. It's best to eat in just times when you eat and times when you don't eat. So if you eat a good sized breakfast, a medium lunch, and then a light early dinner, and you stop snacking in between, that would work well for most people. Some people can do well to have a bigger sort of a brunch, like a little bit later breakfast, and then skip lunch altogether and then have an early dinner. That works well as well. But the worst option is what many people choose, hardly eat anything for the first half of the day, maybe skip all together, maybe a cup of coffee, have a late um, lunch even, like two o'clock in the afternoon, and then have another late dinner, like 8.30, 9 o'clock at night, a big, big meal, and then think they're going to be optimally healthy. That just doesn't work. So I know that's a lot of information, but that's hopefully a summary of what time-restricted eating really involves. So a lot of people are jumping into time-restricted eating because they want to lose weight and because they've heard about the weight loss benefits, and yet it seems like there's so many other benefits beyond weight loss. So can you, can you kind of delve into that a bit? Well, a lot of the benefits of time-restricted eating do revolve around weight loss because weight loss, if it involves, which it should, loss of the inflammatory or visceral fat actually has tremendous benefits in terms of reducing overall inflammation in the body. And it turns out that as we age, we become more and more chronically inflamed as our hormones change, our metabolic systems are not as optimized, and that we call that inflammaging. Well, you can create a similar problem even when you're young, when you're not old, by eating at the wrong time, not getting sleep, not getting adequate sleep, and having chronic stress. All of those kinds of situations can create a similar situation which we call metaflammaging. So it's metabolically induced inflammation. So when you have too much fat, that's part of this whole process of creating an underlying chronic state of inflammation because the white blood cells accumulate in the adipose fat tissue and create this state of lenting inflammation. The other thing that creates inflammation, you eat all the time, when you don't eat according to our genetic programming with time-restricted eating, is the gut health. So it's not just about the fat, but it's about the gut. So the fact it is also on a timer. The enteric or neurological system of the gut, that also is timed as well. And it's time to give us better peristalsis, better movement of the intestinal tract if we consume our food in a perfectly timed way and not eating all the time. As well, the microbial population or the microbiome of the gut is also timed. And you have different types of species of bacteria swarming and doing different things and making different metabolic byproducts based on the food we eat and the time we eat. And this is turning out to be critically important for every aspect of our health, because when you have the healthy, right kinds of microbiome of the gut, you have a healthy lining of the gut, what we call a healthy gut barrier. When that becomes impaired, you get a leaky gut, and that causes the toxins that are now produced by these wrong bacteria to pass through into the body. We call them lipopolysaccharides or endotoxins, and these endotoxins trigger inflammation response, creating all of this production of inflammatory cytokines which circulate through the body and create a state of inflammation everywhere in the vascular system, even in the brain. You have, can get neuroinflammation and that can affect 
your mood, your whole emotional state, as well as your cognitive function. So all of this relates to time-restricted eating, which is a great benefit in addition to reducing fat and losing weight. You get to have a much healthier, more functional intestinal tract with a healthy microbiome, which is related to virtually every single organ system in the body. So that's some of the like incredible ways that time-restricted eating can create incredible health benefits. So it seems like we focus on the fasting side of this. People talk about how many hours did you fast? I went 16 hours, I went 15, I went 13, whatever. What we don't spend as much time talking about in certain circles is what we should be eating during that feasting or feeding period. Right. And, and so why don't we delve into that? And, and while you're talking about this, um, I'm gonna throw out one other thing. Since the last time we uh, talked, two big changes in my eating, and because of you, huge impact in um, all kinds of things, including losing a little bit of the, you know, the belly fat here, also just uh, brighter, more, more alert in the morning, and this is what I did differently. First of all, to your point, I was doing the feeding period, but I was snacking. Not, you know, I was like, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll snack throughout this feeding period. I switched that to having two to three meals, sometimes only two meals a day. The other thing I did, and this one killed me because um, it's, it was, how do you pull back that, that, that last meal? And at first when you told me, like yeah. at the, on the last episode, that you eat like 4.30 or 5, I thought, she is out of her mind. I'm never going to be able to do that. But what I did is I started thinking, I started um, uh, using like a 15-minute a, a timer, and about every two weeks I would pull it back about 15 minutes. Now, and I got back to about 5.30 or 6 is now my where yeah. I'm eating my dinner, where it was 7.30 mm -hmm. or 8. And not that I still don't go out and socialize and there are not times yeah. when, I'm not, when I'm eating maybe a little later, but on average now my, my uh, dinner time is around 5.30. That has been a game changer. It's so exciting to hear that you were able to do that. And I know it's hard with a lot of people's schedules. So I always try to work on an individual basis with every person and I say, you know what, sometimes I hear, well, my spouse, my partner comes home very late or my kids, now it's not as common, you know, but they're going out for this practice or this rehearsal and so on, they come back late. Then I say, you know what, have a very light snack. It's all about socializing. So eat your bigger meal earlier, even if you're doing it by yourself, even if it's a bigger lunch. But, you know, when you're together, you just want to spend time together. It's not about what you eat, it's about spending time. So if that's really the only time that you can get together, have a cup of tea. It takes forever if you get, I have these giant mugs and I, it takes me forever. They're very hot, I have to sip it down and that alone fills you up. And then if you eat something that is predominantly fat, now fat doesn't work on the nutrient sensors the same way as protein and the carbs. So especially the protein is what the sensors are most uh, attuned to picking up. So if you eat something that's predominantly fat, like a small handful of olives or maybe a couple of macadamia nuts or a couple of little chunks or slivers of avocado, and then you have a big mug, you know, like I have like a soup bowl mug of some wonderful herbal tea, and you talk and you're just together, then that works out fine, because often that's what people miss when they start eating their dinners earlier. And you can do that for a late night snack, but basically you just have your mug of tea. You know, you don't have to eat anything. You just spend time together, relax, and, uh, you know, unwind. Okay, so what are the uh, macronutrients then uh, that you should be eating throughout the day? I mean, breakfast, lunch, dinner. You, you mentioned fat, uh, dinner time fat. What would be the proportions of protein, carbohydrates, and fat at your other meals? Well, I'm not actually a big measure. Now, when they do scientific studies on nutrition, they always measure protein and so on, how many protein grams. I actually, in reality, most people are not going to be measuring kinds of their, their intake. So I do more eyeballing kinds of things. So I like to have a blend of all the different macronutrients at every meal. The only reason I say like dinner could be fat, that really would not be 
exactly a meal. That would be sort of an extra just thrown in so you can socialize without raising your blood glucose and your insulin level. It makes sense. In terms of like breakfast, lunch, and dinner, I like to have the majority of the food in terms of protein intake to actually be plant-based proteins. And I limit the animal protein to about three ounces a day. So, you know, the like the little palm, and they say like, if you have like a very small serving that fits into your palm, now everyone has a different size. Yeah, palm, yeah. <laughs> but mine is probably a three ounce palm. You know, some people may have a four ounce, but so it's good to get a scale and weigh it so you can kind of all it. And try to limit your animal protein to no more than three ounces. So I say in terms of looking at something, that would be like a thumbstick size, you know, or like a couple of very shrimps. So we're not talking about a lot. So you take it and you make little pieces. I like to put it into a lid and it's just like little shreds. You can put it into a soup. So it's not like, a, it looks very little. If you, so you just take it into pieces and it's like flavoring, like animal meat flavoring. But you can get tremendous amounts of healthy proteins from plant sources. And in fact, when they looked at, because I deal mostly with women, and their musculoskeletal system, which we know women are the biggest um, developers of osteoporosis, which can really end women's lives, change women's lives when they have fractures. So osteoporosis is a very important thing. And as well, sarcopenia, the loss of muscle mass as you age, is also a very big problem for men, but more for women because they don't have as much to begin with. Turns out that animal protein is not as good as plant-based protein for maintaining the musculoskeletal health of women. So I try to emphasize a big portion of beans or lentils, nuts and seeds, um, by the way, soy, I have to defend soy all the time. When you have organic whole soy, assuming you don't have an allergy, people can have allergies to any food, even the healthiest foods out there, but organic whole soy. So that would be like edamame or the um, miso, tempeh or tofu. That's it's not like pretending to be something else. So it's not soy in a hot dog, that kind of a thing. It's just the whole natural soy. It's really tremendous as a health food. And they've actually shown that it can be a fertility food for women who are trying to get pregnant. It actually helps them to ovulate better. As do seeds, like adding the phytoestrogens, which of course soy is. If you add flax seeds, like a couple of tablespoons a day for women who are looking to conceive or have regular cycles, there's actually published data that it helps them. So these are wonderful foods that are often not in a lot of people's diets. And a lot of soy has been maligned because it's so GMO when it's not organic and they've processed it into weird things. So if you keep that part out and you include the organic, it's a great source of protein and phytoestrogens and other polyphenols. So um, if you have a good serving, and so you can do like the, the plate, you know how they have the plate that the, um, the US government came out with and you, so, cause people are not gonna usually weigh things that much. I like to do it initially just to get an eyeball. So you want to have a good portion of your plate, at least half of it filled with all kinds of colorful vegetables. And then you would like to have maybe a quarter with a plant-based protein, or if you have an animal protein, you just sort of sprinkle it into the vegetables and then you can have a whole grain. Um, it could be something like I love quinoa and millet and amaranth and buckwheat, all of these sort of the, some of the ancient grains that are not processed and they can, and basmati rice is also another good one. And then you can have that as well. So you have plenty of food. In fact, um, I tell people when they're trying to lose weight to eat for breakfast, if they're open to it, I call it the infinite breakfast salad where they take salad and it's all raw healthy foods and they take a bowl like the size of a small serving bowl and they just fill it with all these greens and all kinds of vegetables and nuts and seeds no one can ever finish that but once you eat that you've gotten so many antioxidants and fiber and polyphenols and all of this wonderful stuff that you're, you're not hungry for hours but you know, as we age, we do need to be a little bit more cognizant of protein. So you definitely want to make sure that you get in about, um, you know, between 15 and 20 grams of protein at every meal when, as you're aging, especially postmenopausal women who are at such risk for losing bone and muscle, and we don't want that to happen. So in those groups, I sometimes will give a protein shake, and that is to make sure that they do get enough protein. 
Well, I've been upping um, my plants. I've been plant-based uh, pretty much my entire life, but right now I'm trying to get 30 to 35 different plants per week. I uh, uh, had a podcast guest on, and that there, there's been some studies about the 30. 30, 30 is a kind of a, a good number to shoot for for the week, and at first you go, how can I get 30? But again, it's plants, so it can be your barley and all those vegetables you're talking about. And what I try doing and what I'm recommending is that start mixing it up. I mean, every week go to the grocery store and maybe find one other type of vegetable you haven't experimented with because that really helps the gut biome and helps uh, really uh, keep uh, minimize inflammation and all the other things you talked about. But I wanna switch over for a second to two things. One is this sarcopenia, the loss of muscle mass because obviously as we age, muscle becomes so, so valuable as you yeah. mentioned. And yet what I've noticed is if I fast, if that fasting period for me is too long, and for me that sweet spot is maybe about 13 hours, if I go to a 16 hour fasting period, and I did that for a while, a few months, I started feeling like I was losing muscle mass. So can we talk about how this can maybe backfire if you go too long or am I off base there? No, and, and you're totally right. And what works for one person is not going to work for another and women are definitely different from men. it always drives me crazy that they never differentiate in so many studies the, so uh, the effect of gender differences here so women are very prone to hold on to their fat we are designed to be fat storers you know that's like designed for in case we get pregnant or we're nursing a baby and so forth so we will often hold on to our fat more than we'll hold on to some of our muscle we do have to be very careful about that. And women have figured that out when they've compared with their spouses and that like, how come you lost fat and I didn't, you know? <laughs> because women are really designed to hold on to their fat that's like true. crazy. And we don't want to lose our muscle when, you know, so that's why we love in my office doing body compositions. I, we really want to make sure, especially as women pass through into menopause, things really change. Even when women are on hormone therapy, it's not going to be the same as having ovarian function. Also, a lot of times people don't realize the role of testosterone. So testosterone, of course, is at a fraction the amount in a woman compared to a man. So a woman has maybe one-tenth the amount of testosterone. Testosterone is amazing for helping men to maintain and grow muscle. So if you had like fraternal twins, and they were both complete couch potatoes and they grew up together and they love to just sit on the couch. Okay, now you look at them when they're say 20 years of age, they're both couch potatoes. Okay, they didn't do darn bit of exercise. You can be sure that the male of the fraternal twin set is going to have dramatically more muscle than the female couch potato of the fraternal twin set. Even doing nothing because testosterone is still destiny. Okay, testosterone will help men to build muscle and now obviously if they're exercising they're a lot better but just having testosterone will grow muscle and help to main it, maintain it for men women by the time they're 40 will have about half the amount of testosterone they had when they were 20. it's completely separate from the menopause and that's why women can really rapidly lose um, muscle that they're not even realizing because their testosterone level is dropping. And this is an area that conventional medicine has completely ignored. It's very, very sad. The issue of women losing their testosterone and how that impacts their musculoskeletal system. So fasting, of course, can create a depletion state. So we do have to be careful. Also, when we are trying to become pregnant when we have cycles in the reproductive years if you go into too long of a fasting situation it will alter fertility it will alter ovulation so what we have found is that for females it's really probably optimal to have a fasting window of about 13 hours and there's now published data showing that women who've had breast cancer postmenopausal breast cancer. They have significantly less recurrence of breast cancer if they fast for that magic 13 hours. But you're 100% right. You can go into more of a catabolic state. And as a woman, because we don't have all that testosterone to maintain our muscle the way men do, that we can start burning our, and losing our vital lean body mass, like our muscle. So I do want to be careful, especially as women are 
40s and older as their testosterone level is going to be dramatically lower than what it was when they were in their 20s. Uh, you're right. And I was just reading a, a research study a few weeks ago, and it was talking about this exact uh, point that you can, the scale might say, oh, you've lost four pounds. But if, uh, you know, if two and a half of those pounds were lean, you know, muscle, or, then that's not a good thing. And the, the other pound and a half, and that's kind of what they're seeing is happening in some of this longer fasting with women, as you said. But uh, one of the things that, um, another question, because we put this out to our audience and we got we, hundreds of questions, but another one uh, that was prevalent with the group is, so where do I fit exercise in? If I'm going to eat, uh, and if my window, if I'm gonna eat at nine o'clock in the morning, let's say, can, can I have an exercise uh, class or can I do my workout or whatever at 7 a.m. in a fasted state? Is that preferable or not? It's actually very preferable. So there's actually good data now that if you, now this is for healthy people, we're not talking about frail or you know, people who are recovering from illness or surgery, but in healthy, basically healthy people, if they exercise on a fast in the morning and then they eat afterwards, they will actually lose weight if they need to lose weight, they'll lose weight more readily. And when you eat with protein, after you've exercised, you will actually rebuild and grow more lean body mass, like more muscle, better. So it turns out that that is really an excellent time. In general, if you want to lose weight, the optimal thing is to exercise on a fast in the morning and then eat your big breakfast. However, they've actually shown that if your main goal is building muscle, you actually can do better if you exercise in the afternoon between your lunch, say if you have lunch, between lunch and dinner, so you're exercising still, it's on a semi-fast, and then you have your nice small dinner afterwards, your early dinner. So that actually is the best way to build muscle, but losing, but you'll still do very well in terms of building some muscle if you exercise in the morning. But for weight loss, exercising in the morning on a fast is the best way to accelerate your weight loss, weight loss goals and, goals and reach them. Okay, so then let's uh, talk about what constitutes a fast <clears throat> or breaking the fast. Can I, if I, am I still on my fast if I have a cup of coffee, some green tea, uh, some lemon in my water? I mean, are there certain things that we say, you, that you can tell us like, okay, it is just, you know, my way or the highway, just water and that's it? Or are there other, not cheat things, but can you, can you take your stimulant green tea, coffee in the morning, or is that breaking the fast? Well, we have less data on that than we would like, but generally speaking, if you have a caffeinated beverage in the morning, it's not the same at all as breaking your fast, but it's going to have a slight modification. But uh, it seems to be generally okay if you have one cup. So if like you have one cup of black coffee or one cup of green tea has about half the caffeine as coffee. So as generally a coffee would have. So you could probably even do two cups of green tea that would equal one cup of coffee. So that would probably be acceptable because you're still going to have tremendous benefits. In fact, they've shown that you could actually have a little bit of fat in the morning, like maybe a couple of macadamia nuts, not a lot, you know, very, very little, a few, a few olives, and it probably won't really register as you're breaking the fast because you have no protein in any of that to speak of. So there's actually a little cheating that's allowed. You know, so I would say you don't have to do pure water and you'll still get tremendous benefits. You know, lemon, you know, there's not really a lot of data. If you do a splash of lemon, I, I feel that that would probably be okay if that's just a splash of lemon. If you're starting to have whole lemon you know, quarters or something, that's probably gonna be over the top. But I think you'd be okay with a splash of lemon, some green tea, some black coffee to get you going in the morning, that's okay. Okay, and then what about throughout the day? A lot of people are asking, what about my diet soda? Thinking that the diet doesn't have the calories in it. Uh, uh, drinks throughout the day. Uh, so you have your breakfast, you're gonna have your big breakfast, your moderately big lunch, and then smaller dinner, or however you decide to vary those meals. But what about between those meals? Once again, is it 
water. If I go, obviously, we're not going to suggest you have, a, you know, a, a soda. But then some people are saying, what about my diet sodas, my kombuchas, my whatever might be their go-to drink? How does that fit in? Well, those can be catastrophes as far as <laughs> um, overall health. So I have to say, never drink any diet soda if it has artificial, any kind of sweetener in it, okay? So they've shown that your body is not gonna do well. In fact, you're as likely to develop diabetes if you're drinking like Diet Coke as if you're drinking a regular Coke. It's shocking, but it actually affects the, your gut microbiome in, in a multitude of ways that creates leaky gut and inflammation. And inflammation drives insulin resistance. So, and then that's the ticket to diabetes. So we don't want to put any of those chemicals. Of course, I'm anti all kinds of chemicals in food because they don't have a place. So we don't want to do the, the diet soda. Now, what if you had the sparkling waters that have a little bit of like citrus flavor or something like that. If you have one, you know, that's probably not going to be a problem. We don't have data, like nobody's doing a study on just like what happens if you drink one of those carbonated, uh, like, you know, seltzer waters that just have a little bit of citrus flavor, like a, probably if you have just a little bit, it's not gonna have a big impact. If that's really, if you just hate drinking um, plain herbal tea or you just don't like water and you just have to have that, probably that's, a very minor deviation. I, I wouldn't say that it's all or nothing. I, I never make it quite that strict because okay. people have to have enjoyment in life. If that's what they want to drink, I think that's okay. If they have, it has no calories, it's just a tiny bit of you know citrus flavor. That would probably be acceptable. In terms of herbal teas, you can drink all the herbal teas that you want. In fact, that's great. You'll hydrate up and that's so good for you. So many people are basically living their lives in a somewhat dehydrated state. So and we know that for your brain to function well, for your whole body to function well, you really need to be well hydrated. And so herbal teas are great, but you don't want to do something like kombucha because that usually has a fairly high sugar content. So make sure that what you have basically has no sugar in it. Like if it's something on a can, that I don't love drinking things out of cans, but if you do, make sure it says sugars zero, okay? You don't want sugars to be anything but zero. So you really are limited in between your meals what you should be drinking. So, you know, you could have all the herbal tea you want. And by the way, there are so many amazing herbal teas. It's not like it tastes the same, all of them taste the same. So experiment, you know, you'll find, I'm sure you'll find one that you love. I you know, I love like the vanilla rooibos tea. I mean, that I could drink any time. And it's just, you'll find something that you love. I promise you, if you try lots of different herbal teas, and then it won't be such a struggle to, to know what to drink in between your meals. Right, I'm, I'm with you there. I have a whole shelves of herbal teas and experimenting and switching them off with the seasons oh. and how I feel and, yeah. you know, what oh, I want from them. Cinnamon. But, have you tried cinnamon cinnamon tea? I just love it. Oh. And you, there's all these like spicy teas that have, you know, some of the uh, cardamom and so on. So and the yeah, ginger, right. get some ginger yeah. in there. When I, I want to get ginger. like in, in Park it. City here, you want to warm up your body. You, you, you get a ginger tea going. But, you know, um, I know we're talking about rules and we want to make sure we get the rules out there. But I'm a big believer that you learn the rules and then you it's a dance and depending on socially what you're going to be doing if you're if you're going if i'm going for a a day of skiing then you know i i will maybe shift the rule a little bit because i'm going to be on the mountain or i'm going to need a little bit more energy or whatever it is but but it's nice to know the rules i mean th this is what i love about what we're, we're talking about right now because you're clarifying all this so clarify one more thing for me and that is the skeptics are saying and what we get a lot of is well wait a second we always learned it was calories in calories out it's total calories doesn't matter if you eat them um uh, an hour before bedtime or you eat them throughout the day it's about total caloric expenditure can you address that oh sure well in a way that is still true it is calories in calories out but the calories out is sort of like the this nebulous part you can always sort of calculate you know if you actually put your mind to it the calories in but how our bodies metabolize absorb and utilize the food that you're putting in is really variable depending on the time of day. 
And so it, we really are different in terms of our digestive system, how we digest and move the food along is different depending on the time of day. The blood sugar levels that you get will be very variable. So for example, you could eat the same exact meal at eight o'clock in the morning and eight o'clock at night. And if you measure with your blood sugar levels and your insulin levels, an hour, two hours, three hours after those meals, they'll be very different. Now that really matters because one of the things that happens, the way that people eat when they eat frequently or they eat at the wrong time of day is that they get high levels of insulin. Now, we think that we can multitask, but there's something we cannot multitask and we cannot be making and burning fat at the same time. I can guarantee you, nobody does that. Insulin is a life essential hormone. In fact, like type one diabetics who have no production of insulin, they will die without insulin. So we need insulin. But when we have too much and too high a chronic state of insulin, then we cannot lose weight. So it turns out that insulin is the hormone that promotes and our ability to make and store fat. So when you have constant insulin that's being produced by the body and it's high and it's constant, you will always be storing fat and making new fat and you cannot burn fat. So it's not just how you eat, it's, over, it's really when you eat and how your body is going to utilize it and what your state of metabolism is. So if you eat at the wrong time of day, you're going to get much higher glucose, much higher insulin levels, and that's going to promote fat storage. And it's really very different at the time of day that you eat the same food. So it's definitely calories in, calories out. But the calories out will be very different depending on when you put those calories in. This is really a critical message. And they had an interesting study many years ago where they took prisoners, and that was a good group of people to work with, and they gave them identical meals, and they gave them some of them the same, and they, and they flipped the people, so it was the same group. So they had some, for part of the time, they took the same meal, which was a big meal, and they had it at breakfast, and then they flipped it to the evening, late in the evening. And so it was exactly the same meal, exactly the same calories. When they ate that food in the morning, they lost weight. When they ate that food at night, they gained weight. Fascinating. So, and this was years ago. So it's like amazing, but it's just hasn't really been implemented into our recommendations until now. So we need to understand the science that it's not just a random coincidence that this is happening. It's really built into our genes. And it turns out that about a third of our genes in our bodies are clock genes, and about 90% altogether are somehow affiliated with clock genes. So we are always living and working on the clock. The other thing that happens when you eat at the wrong time, the, the gut doesn't work the same and you end up getting this dysbiotic or abnormal gut microbiome, that creates this dysbiosis, this inflammation, which goes right to the liver. There's an incredible connectivity between the gut and the liver. And then you get inflammation in the liver, which drives the development of fatty liver, which is now at epidemic levels. Fatty livers are dysregulated livers. And, and the inflamed liver then will produce too much glucose at, in a totally dysregulated, inappropriate way. We call that dysregulated gluconeogenesis, uncontrolled gluconeogenesis, the, the production of glucose, which the liver makes sugar from its storage of glycogen. It will also produce creatively tremendous amounts of triglycerides, fats that the body doesn't need, so, and cholesterol. So you have a dysregulated liver that's spewing out sugar and fats and cholesterol. And we know that, of course, that's what we see in people who are overweight, who have fatty livers and so on. And that is actually a derivative of eating even the right foods, but at the wrong time. You're going to end up much more likely to have this dysregulated liver that is going to create metabolic havoc in your body. And so you mentioned <clears throat> glucose a lot, you know, as it relates to insulin, as it relates to the liver. Um, do you wear a glucose monitor? I know a lot of people are doing that now. Do you recommend that you or your patients wear an, a, a monitor of some sort so that you can see what your insulin levels are throughout the day and after you eat? I recommend a continuous glucose monitor very frequently. I recommend it to all of my patients who have elevated blood sugars, who have elevated hemoglobin A1Cs, who have obesity or even overweight, or they're, they're saying that they just can't lose weight. 
So I use it very frequently now. And it's one of those things that's on my to-do list for myself. I actually haven't done it for myself, but I am going to be doing it. In fact, I'm going to do more, what we have in our office. We call it a reset. So um, I haven't done that in about almost a year now. COVID kind of got me off track in a lot of ways too. So I'm going to do my the reset that we advocate to like elimination diet and gut and liver healing. And then I am going to do the continuous glucose monitor on myself as well. But I've been recommending it for all of my targeted patients. I wouldn't say every single patient that comes to my office, but people who have metabolic issues, because often it's it's really amazing. We now know that the gut microbiome actually can determine what our glucose response to a specific food or group of foods might be. So we used to think, well, this particular food has a high glycemic load or a low glycemic load or index. And now we find that it's much more individualized that certain people, depending on their gut microbes, they may have a totally different response and create a different serum level of glucose than another individual. So that's really the whole new wave of personalized precision medicine where we can find out what your personal response is. Now, if it's like you're eating a food that should normally be healthy and shouldn't give you a giant spike of glucose, but it does, that's another clear cut indication that your gut microbiome needs a lot of work because that shouldn't be happening. That's a sign that you have, you're creating endotoxins, you're creating inflammation and your body's response is not really normal. So that's not something that we would want to just ignore and just say, don't eat that food. We would want to say right now, don't eat that food perhaps, or eat it with other combinations of foods. But we also wanted them really focus on working on that gut and that liver. Okay, well, <clears throat> I'll be your accountability buddy because I also am gonna, in 2021, that was my goal to get a continuous glucose uh, monitor and uh, to start measuring that, to just start understanding how food, as you mentioned, how it impacts each of us and how, you know, if I can eat oatmeal or not eat oatmeal or mm -hmm. yeah, baked potatoes or carrots or things that before were like, this is a no-no because of the glycemic factor, but perhaps in your body doesn't impact it the same way. So I'm excited about starting that. Um, and so it's, I'm glad to hear that you are too. My thing, uh, I'm gonna have to let you go because I could go forever, but I know our times, uh, your, your time is precious. So let me just ask you, you mentioned you're gonna be doing a reset diet and mm -hmm. uh, that you do every year or you do occasionally, and you're gonna do right. it soon. Tell me about this diet and how can our listeners and viewers hear uh, more about it or read more about it? Sure, so it's kind of a standard elimination diet. So it turns out there are certain foods that are actually healthy foods, but in some people, they tend to be more uh, reactive. They have some kind of a reaction to it. And sometimes you, the only way to know it is by actually taking them out of the diet and then reintroducing them. There's not actually a test. It's not a food allergy. It's more like a reaction of sensitivity. So some of those foods that people react to, which I say are not intrinsically harmful, they're, they're just that people react to them, are eggs and fish and tree nuts and soy and citrus fruits and chocolate. And of course we take out, now I don't actually drink alcohol, but for those who do, we take out alcohol. And we also take out caffeinated beverages because some people are very dependent on them and it affects their sleep. So we take out all the caffeinated beverages. So we're left with um, most fruits and vegetables. There are a few, a few different fruits, certain berries that sometimes people react to. So we have whole lists of these types of foods. They're not, like I said, they're not bad foods at all. They can be very healthy, but they're the ones that most commonly are associated with sensitivities. And so we take, out, take them out for an entire month. And during that month, we also do some gut support. So there are certain supplements that contain demulcents. Those are like coating agents, like marshmallow root and aloe and slippery elm. And then the nutrients that help the gut, like the amino acid, L-glutamine, which we know that the lining cells of the gut love, and zinc carnosine, which is very healing to the gut. And zinc, we know, is very important for healing. And that particular form is very focused on gut healing. In some cases, I will give a short chain fatty acid butyrate because that can also help. That's for people who have maybe irritable bowel syndrome and so on, where I may add in the, the butyrate. And then for D3 
detoxification support, we give some of these extracts that come from cruciferous vegetables like DIM and sulforaphane. And then we give N-acetylcysteine, which has also been shown to help with the detoxification pathways of the body. And then we introduce to our patients, of course, I'm already doing it, but the idea that we've talked about all this time about time-restricted eating. So we introduce that as well. And then we also deal with a lot of toxicants. So we want to try to lower our patients' use of plastics and chemicals because these endocrine disruptors are very, very devastating to the metabolic pathways of the body. And they, in fact, they even have names for them. They call them diabesogens. <laughs> They're the chemicals that are ubiquitous, they're enveloping our, our lives, and these chemicals are affecting our metabolic pathways. So we also educate our patients on how to lower their exposures to these ubiquitous toxicants that are interfering with their metabolic pathways. And then, of course, we work on stress. We talk, look into stress. So my personal favorite is guided imagery, and I'm trying to listen to guided imagery, CDs, and downloads every single day. And I'm going to really focus on that as well. So it's basically a total gut healing, liver support kind of a, of a program. Well, I have a guided imagery program, so I'll send it to you because I, oh, I, I love I, it. Um, and so where can people find out about this, uh, this reset program? Do they have to come to you personally or do you have a program online? Um, well, it's, do it's not done <clears throat> by a recording. We always do things in person, but in person <clears throat> can include online. Okay. So yes, we can do it with telemedicine. So my, my brick and mortar practice where I'm speaking to you right now from an exam room that, um, that I have, I have several. And so my brick and mortar practice is in Irvine, California, that's in sunny Southern California. And my practice name is Integrative Medical Group of Irvine. And we are able to do a variety of things with telemedicine. So I think what you need to do is get your online course going because everything you said in that last few minutes, uh, it's brilliant. And I wanna, I wanna um, be part of that program. And I think I, you know, I'll, I'll check in with you, I'll, I'll make an appointment, but I would love to be able to go through a reset program like that. And, um, but it'd be nice if you, if you could also get a group going and do an online course, because I also find those kind of fascinating. And you're so good that a six week course or something like this online, that should be your next project. Which well, <laughs> you're highly motivating me. You know, these are things that I know I should probably do. You know how you get so busy, you yeah. just work every day and doing these things. But really, that's the type of thing that once again, 2021, I should actually do create these kinds of programs that you're suggesting because it'll be more maybe affordable and more um, usable that people can also judge, you know, do things to their own time like they want to do it at night or on a weekend. Well, that's it. I just went through uh, Will Bolsowicz's course, uh, uh, which was six weeks and he's a gut doctor. And um, I love the, you know, it's, it's with teachables and you, you know, you have a little, you know, you have a little video of you every day. It could be four or five minutes, but it's these bite-sized uh, chunks of information that you just absorb for the course of a week and then the next week and then once a week, you have a group call with everybody. We had 600 people in the class. And wow. yeah, no, it's great. And you, you would, you, people would flock to this. I'm telling you, you should do it. I'll, I'll talk to you about it uh, afterwards. Okay. But anyway, but anyway, Felice, I have to let you go. Thank you for taking your valuable time. It's, you know, information is priceless and you really are changing the world and giving very usable information that people can start to just take and adapt, start adapting their diets. It doesn't have to be radical. I think that's your message. You can start slowly making a little change Absolutely. week by week. And eventually what you'll find is a year later, you have transformed your eating and your life and your microbiome and your brain and your weight and your waistline. So thank you for all you do. Well, it's my pleasure. And by the way, I am going to steal your idea of using the timer. I love that idea of just setting it back 15 minutes and you just take little baby steps to changing your timing. I, I This is how we learn from each other. I think that was a brilliant idea. I'm definitely <laughs> going to incorporate that as well. And it's my pleasure to, to have this opportunity to speak with you and your wonderful audience. Thank you, Felice. Big hug. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. 
It was such a delight to have Felice on the show today. So many people are stepping into time-restricted eating because they view it as a way to uh, lose weight. It's a weight loss accelerator. Yet there's so many more benefits, including lengthening your health span, reducing insulin resistance, improving heart health, and really important, boosting your immunity, which is so important right now. But here's the takeaway. Just like working out, there's an adaptation process. And you might need to ease into this type of eating and give your body time to adapt. So in the gym, your body needs time to get used to a new routine, lifting weights, lifting heavier weights. The same is true when shifting your eating habits. When you first start out, you might want to just start with a 12-hour eating window, eating and fasting. So you start, you stop eating at 7 p.m., you start eating at 7 a.m., and that will eventually become easy for you. Then you can lengthen the time that you fast. Now, if you want more information about time-restricted eating from Dr. Felice Gersh, visit her website, which is integrativemgi.com. Remember, your body changes and so should your workouts. My big motto. So join me for a workout anywhere in the world with Fit Over 40. It's a free, I repeat, it's a free program that includes 14 days of workouts. And you can get strength training and walking and HIIT training. You can go and do a bar workout or an ab routine. Plus, the private Facebook community is over 50,000 people now. And they're encouraging members who are doing the challenge, but they're there to give you inspiration and maybe be your accountability buddy. We all need that when we're trying to reach our goals. And all you have to do is go to kathysmith.com to join. Okay, here's the big takeaway. If you've enjoyed this episode, don't forget there's so many others out there. Dozens, hundreds now. So if you're wanting tips on how to transition to a whole, to a more whole food plant-based diet, then check out Dr. Joel Kahn's show. That's episode 89. Or if you want some motivation to get in shape for 2021, and we all do, don't miss the conversation with my daughter, Kate Grace, on episode 87. And if you're not completely satisfied with your sex life, then be a little brave and check out Cindy Eckhart's interview in episode 83. You can find all these shows and more at kathysmith.com slash podcast. The podcast is available wherever you listen, so just search The Art of Living with Kathy Smith. Whether you're on Apple Podcasts, whether you're on Stitcher or Spotify, and you'll find all these episodes. And one thing that I found out and was very funny, you can even, even go, hey Siri, play Kathy Smith podcast, and my voice popped up when I did that. So. With that in mind, just think about the, your goals. Think about what you're trying to achieve. Think about giving love and connection to everybody out there in your world. And from me to you, I just want to tell you, I adore you, I love you, and here's to your health.